Hi everybody. I'm back and I wanted to talk a little bit about how recovery is going and what I'm doing. Just got back from a reunion in um, New Mexico, which was a lot of fun. It was my 39th high school reunion, but we were thrown in with a big group of um, other high school graduates. And so the, the group was about four years worth of students, which was fun because you don't always hang out with the people in your own grade. So a lot of the kids that were older than me are the ones I actually hung out with. Because when I was growing up, my best friend was a year older than me, so I knew all of her friends. And then I dated a guy in high school that was a year older than me, so I knew all of those kids. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to see everybody. There was some high school drama, which I guess is typical. Maybe that still happens, but it seems odd. 39 years later, people are still you know, talking about things that happened in high school. And anyway, but it was a lot of fun. Had a great time, went to a homecoming game and just talked it up and didn't have but one drink at the reunion because I'm still regrowing my liver. So I was kind of being careful of my liver. But there were a lot of people who drank plenty. I'm sure the venue made a lot of money on that cash bar they had. So no problems there. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you about, one, the hair. This is just insanity. Somebody recently asked me if I was going to keep it gray, and I was like, what are you saying? My hair's not gray, it's silver. So silver is the color I'm calling it. Maybe it's really brown with some flecks of silver. I don't know. But when you're in recovery and you think about putting chemicals on your head, you kind of think twice. Maybe one of these days when it's longer and I just like really feel like maybe it's adding to my age, maybe then I'll do it. Right now, I look a lot like my grandmother. When I was bald, I looked like my father. If I can find a picture of my grandmother, I will post it up here, over here, over here. I don't know. I'll try to add it to the video. I'm not very good at this yet. But she had curly hair, and she was about my size when I was growing up, and um, wonderful woman. We called her Nana, and I go by Nana now. I had another grandmother we called Grandma Marvel, and she was also awesome, but I didn't get to spend as much time with her as I did Nana. Nana traveled more than Grandma Marvel, so that's why I got to spend more time with her. Anyway, I'm a Nana now, and I have a granddaughter, and she's delightful, so anyway. I think Nana was a better Nana than I am because she cooked a lot more for us, but say la vie. So anyway, um, I, before I went to the reunion, I did my um, first three months after being declared no evidence of disease, um, CT scan and PET scan. And there's a thing called scanxiety for um, recovering cancer patients or people who are in remission where you get anxious because you don't want to have a reoccurrence. So every scan, there's scanxiety. There was a, I don't know, I guess with the first scans, you had so much anxiety because they found stuff. And for me, um, they thought I was stage four at the initial um, diagnosis. Turned out I wasn't. I had two different cancers, which who knew that would actually be good news at that time. And then I was determined to be stage four last year. So scans have not brought me good news. Scans have brought me bad news. So I, I thought, well, okay, I had the scan and I could go to the, doc I could go to the, um, the scanning uh, center and I could pick up the results and the images and they put them on a CD and they give you the report. And I had the scan on Friday and I could pick up everything on Monday, which I did. And I haven't opened them. They're sitting right here. There's the disc and here's the report. And they are waiting for me to um, finish all of my diagnostic uh, updates and get the results directly from my oncologist. Now, the reason I didn't open them is it's either good news or it's bad news. And I'm going to get the results from my oncologist and I'm going to take these into my liver surgeon 
at my next appointment with him, which is in about two more months. But I have a wonderful oncologist and he will, if the news in the report looks like it has some like new little thing that showed up, <coughs> excuse me, he will physically pick up the phone and call the radiologist that read the report and he will ask them, hey, you know this thing that showed up in this report that you're mentioning, I looked at the scan, could you go back and look at all the other scans and see if that actually showed up in any other scan and when it first started showing up so we know whether or not it's been there all along and we don't need to worry about it or if it's something new. And the radiologist, real time, will pull up those those scans, take a look at them, and give him verbal information that he would not give me if I just were to open this and read it. So rather than read it and see, oh wait, there's some new spot somewhere, I'm going to wait for my oncologist to read it, call the radiologist, get all the updated information, and then give me the results. Um, it take, that takes a, a tremendous amount of restraint. <laughs> takes a lot of courage. I did not want to disturb my glory here because, or my joy, because I have been celebrating. It's been two years of this and I've been celebrating since they told me in um, May or June, end of, well, no, it was about the first of June that I was in remission. I thought, you know what? I am going to celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. So if I open this, then maybe the celebration ends, maybe it's back. So I didn't want to do that before I went on this reunion trip and I didn't want to do that before I spent a week with my sister and I didn't want to do that and worry about it until I talked to my oncologist. So I didn't. And um, people go, how could you just leave it in the envelope? And I'm like, well, this just, it's easier to do that than to freak out. So I'm not freaking out. Is Until I hear my oncologist say that it's back, I'm still in remission. So if I only have two more weeks of that fun, then I'm gonna enjoy the two more weeks of fun. So anyway, that's where that stands. I have another um, maintenance diagnostic test on Monday, the dreaded colonoscopy that everybody hates. And I'm here to tell you, um, don't put it off. Don't put it off, it could save your life. So get all these tests done. I think maybe at age 50, they ought to just scan everybody because the, the weird thing is once you're diagnosed with something, once they find a tumor or something in your body, the first thing they do is send you for a CT scan. Well, if they find anything in the CT scan, then they send you for a PET scan to see if it lights up in the PET scan. So everybody by age 50 something has something in their body that shows up. You've got something. You don't know it, but you've got a spot on your spleen or a spot on your liver or a spot in your kidney. And maybe it's been there. A friend of mine has a spot in her kidney. It's been there like 12 years. She doesn't know how long it's been there. It's been there for a long time. They watch it. it hasn't done anything. Um, you could have a spot in your liver that doesn't do anything. You could have spots in your lungs that are scar tissue. You could, I mean, my mother was going in for a, a heart valve surgery and they couldn't do the surgery until they confirmed what these spots were in her lungs. She had a CT scan. She was in her 80s. She had a CT scan. Something showed up in her lungs. Turned out it was nothing but scar tissue from some um, infection she had as a child. And anyway, we've got stuff. We've got stuff. So the first time you get these scans, if you've been diagnosed with a cancer, they have to find out what all the other spots are. Are those? That's why they send you for the PET scan. If they light up, then you're then they're worried that maybe it's stage four, maybe they need to go back and and uh, look for stuff and do some more diagnostic work. I have now had, I've now had biopsies taken of rectal tissue. I have had biopsies taken. I had a right lung biopsy surgery one year and then almost exactly a year later, they were both in 2018, but almost exactly a year later, I had a left lung biopsy because something showed up in my left lung. And I had a liver biopsy. And it's just like every time something shows up, they're going to find out what it is because if you're stage four, the treatment gets more aggressive. And, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad they've done all these tests, but I don't want to open this and kill my joy until I have to. I have the colonoscopy test Monday. I will talk to the, um, 
gastroenterologist immediately following that. She'll tell me if she found anything. Um, she's doing a complete colonoscopy because I haven't had one in several years and she just is setting a new um, baseline. The original tumor was located in my rectum, which, you know, gross topic, but there you have it. Um, it is what it is. So anyway, the whole colon has not been scanned. They've done short little things and they've done little investigations and little biopsies and things, but the whole colon has not been scanned. So she's doing that for a new baseline. So that'll start me over for the whole standard colonoscopy process. Anyway, um, that's what's going on with the diagnostic stuff and me being in remission and there's a little bit more tension, a little bit more anxiety because it's unknown and now the I'm back from vacation and it's weighing a little bit more heavily on my little gray head, but I've been throwing myself into my um, extracurricular activities, my crafting stuff that I enjoy so much and I have been... Um, really, really excited about some of the stuff I'm working on. So I thought, you know, that's one way. A lot of people throw themselves into work. A lot of people throw themselves into television. Some people read incessantly. Some people journal. Some people, you know, just throw themselves into life and taking care of their kids. And, you know, everybody has their own escape mechanisms. You know, and I do a lot of praying and I do a lot of talking to God and, I do a lot of beach combing because that's what I like, but when I get home from the beach and I still have a lot of tension and, you know, pent up, you know, nerves, I like to craft. So I have been um, making sea glass items and I don't have any of those handy to show you, but I found a bunch of sea glass. I, I have sea glass everywhere in my house now, but I, I took, um, maybe I have some over here. Nope. I do have some sea glass. It's not stuff I found. This is stuff my sister bought for me. Little, little sea glass things. These are from Florida. Very pretty. Anyway, um, I decided last year I would call my thing Sea the Cure, and I would make sea glass pendants, drill holes in little sea glass pieces, put little charms on them, and sell them for Relay for Life. And I did that, and I had a lot of fun. It was very successful. But and I have a ton of sea glass. I'm probably gonna do the same thing again. But this year I've been finding these weird things on the beach. They're paint and I'm gonna show them to you right now. And they're really cool. I hope this shows up really well. This one has resin on it, which is what I do. And you flip it over and the backside looks at that. It looks like that. And if you, I don't know how well that's focusing, but if you, if you find them on the beach, they they have little places where the paint has worn off and you can see, let's see if I can find another good one here. Here's a good one, it's really bright and it already has a hole drilled in it and it's getting ready to have a, this one's going to a friend of mine. Um, I've already gifted it, but it's not wanting to focus, it wants to focus on me. Anyway, it looks kind of like an anatomically correct heart and I really liked that for specific reasons that I won't go into. I had a good view of my armpit there. Here, let's do this. Uh, anyway, this one's going to a friend of mine. It has a hole drilled in it. And it's a little charm size, about the size of my thumbnail. But you can see where the paint wore off and the different colors were exposed. And I started finding them on the beach and I thought, well, that's really interesting. I wonder what I could do with those. So I started, red, um, I mean, I've been finding them for about two years, but I've been coating them this year. I've been coating them in resin and drilling holes in them. And that was successful and I like the way they're turning out. And I have a couple of pieces that like, this is a really big one. And this one, I layered some of the pieces of um, paint because I was finding more like tiny pieces that weren't really colored. This side has the layered pieces in it. And I kind of, cut that one in the shape of a heart. It's pretty big. And anyway, these will be, since they're paint chips, these will be called the, I have the See the Cure collection. And these will be called Chip Away at Cancer because they're paint chips. And I have to thank my sister, Diane, who comes up with these wonderful names. 
And then we spent a lot of time walking on the beach in Patrick's Point in Northern California when um, Joe and I were first married. We would go up there, I don't know, every summer, every other summer with his family. They, they did a lot of travel up there and you can find these on the beach, agates. So I bought a Dremel, as you can tell, for the sea glass and I've just gone crazy with the Dremel. I've been drilling holes and everything. Crazy. Just drilling holes. Here's one that I think is Jasper, but that's a family joke. Everything that wasn't an agate was Jasper. So drilled holes in pretty much everything I came across except my children. Drilled holes in everything. And this one, there's a critter that lives in the ocean in the California area that makes holes in stones. And these are some kind of sedimentary rock. And the critter made that hole. Now from my, and so I put charms on those and I sold some of those for Relay for Life this year too. Anyway, my cousin says the stones that you find on the beach with the holes already in them are called hag stones. And I don't know what the significance is of that. I probably should look it up before I talk about it online. But I did, I did drill holes in just plain old stones too. These, these sedimentary rock, you can drill a hole in that in like lickety split. These guys, these agates, they are really hard. They can take 10 minutes to drill a hole in that. So anyway, resin, way faster to drill a hole in. Then I went a little bit crazy and I thought, well, you know what? This, this paint is turning out really, really cute. These little paint chips, but they're hard to find. And you only find like maybe one or two a week. Now I have a whole collection because I go to the beach all the time, but I needed more. So I Googled, there's a, there's a stuff called Fordite that was paint that accrued on the workings of the paint factory, like the, the metal um, support structures around cars that were being painted. And this stuff builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. And they, um, they call it Fordite because Ford or Detroit agate, because when you chip it off and you slice it just right, all those paint layers show up. So I Googled how to make fake Fordite. And you can do that, and I did it, I tried it with, um, with Sculpey clay. I almost said that wrong. I always mispronounce that. So I made some Sculpey clay layers, and then I ended up, you, you layer it, layer it, layer it, and then I ended up making these, and they turned out pretty cute. So one of my dreams over the summer holiday that I went on was to go to Cadillac Ranch, because people were saying, oh, well, Cadillac Ranch has a lot of paint chips that you can just pick up off the ground. And so guess what I did? While I was on my reunion trip, I went to Cadillac Ranch. And I will try to post a picture of me actually at Cadillac Ranch. It was so hot, I almost had heat exhaustion. My sister was laughing at me because she was like, oh, you wanna stay out here and pick up paint chips? And I was like, I think I'm gonna throw up. It was so hot. And she had been sipping water on the road all the way up there. We drove from Lubbock, Texas to Amarillo. And she'd been sipping water and I hadn't, foolishly. And then I left my water in the car, which was also foolish. And then I got out there and started picking up stuff and I was just like, oh, this is not good. But I got, I got about this much in the bottom of a gallon baggie and I'm going to start working with that. I'm having so much fun with this stuff. I love this one. This is a, this is from the, um, beach. This is beach paint chip, which I thought was just this little yellow one, really, really pretty. And then you flip it over and it's got this on the other side. So these will be reversible. But the, and then I, I have broken dishes. Like I said, I drilled holes in everything. Everything that didn't move. These are my broken dishes. And I saved them because I used to make picture frames and stuff with broken dishes. But I drilled holes in those. So pretty much if it wasn't nailed down this spring, I was drilling holes in it. The year before, I was into paint by numbers. And I did like four paint by numbers. And then I got tired of it. And the last one's still sitting on my mantle. I never framed it. Maybe I'll do that soon. But there seemed to be some hobby or craft that would get me out of bed, get me moving, keep my mind busy so I didn't worry about stuff like this. And I highly recommend a craft or a hobby 
just because you don't want to sit around worrying. You just don't. You don't want to do it. I also recommend this little guy, the Fitbit, because if you set it up right, it will actually bitch at you if you don't get up and do your steps. I have a friend that when it starts snarking at her, she gets up. She did this at my house yesterday. She gets up, just starts walking around. Just got to get my steps, got to get my steps. Now, I understand that, except this woman gets on a treadmill every day and walks God knows how many steps. I guess she probably does 6,000 steps on a treadmill every day and then lets her Fitbit gripe at her throughout the day so she keeps moving. So she's going to outlive all of us. My hat's off to you, Sue. Literally, since I don't wear hats anymore. Anyway, um, maybe the next video I will tell you about how I found this wonderful oncologist who makes those phone calls and does all these wonderful things for me. Um, I did fire two people, and one of the reasons I wanted to make these videos is because I wanted to empower people, especially women, to fire people that are on their cancer team that suck, because really, it's your life. It's not their life. It's your life. And um, my dad, I had asthma as a kid, and every time I got sick, my dad would ask the doctors and nurses to treat me as though they were treating their own child. And so now when I see somebody, I ask them to treat me as though they were treating their own wife or their own mother, because that's what it is. That's what it is. If they give you less care than that, then you don't need them on your team. Don't, don't put up with it. So, um, a little cliffhanger my next video. I'm aiming for that to be, I tried to get my sister to do it with me and she was just like, eh, not really interested. But uh, she was with me for two of these appointments, one where I interviewed the new oncologist and one where it was the last time I saw the old oncologist. And the other person that I let go off of my team was a gastroenterologist. And both of these, both of these individuals were really not worthy of treating anyone. And a note to anyone out there in the medical profession, care of the cancer patient, care of any seriously ill patient is not just the medical care. Care of the seriously ill patient is hugely how you approach the patient and how you either give hope or take hope. And I went in with a fighting spirit, but some people don't. I mean, I went in with, give me, give me, everything you got. Give me both barrels because I'm going to kill this thing. I'm not going to die right now. I'm just not. My dad died at 64 and I wasn't even 64 and I was like, that's not going to happen. My dad's not going to live longer than I did. That's not okay. He was way too young. And so I was like, this is, give me everything you got. And this, they weren't, the, the oncologist just was not, he wasn't on board with that. He was basically yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. So we'll get into that more later. And um, I encourage you to go out and find a passion. Um, have some fun. Um, the more active your passion is, the better. If you can get out and walk on the beach, if you can take up swimming or golf or anything that keeps you moving, that always is good for you, no matter whether you're healthy or you're sick. And um, I just, I have become just this jewelry, jewelry freak this year and so wanted to share that with you. Hopefully some of these things will eventually be on sale for um, Relay for Life. I might put them in an Etsy store or something. I don't know. This, this video is not about hawking my wares. This video is about encouraging everyone to find the joy in their life, find something they love, and do it. So anyway, um, I really enjoy these videos. I hope you do too. This one wasn't nearly as funny. Maybe I should show you um, what I found at an estate sale recently because I was wanting one. We'll put a little humor on this at the very end. So here you go. That's my little, I thought when I found it, antlers, maybe I should tip back a little bit more. I thought when I found it, it was, it's from Casey, Wyoming, 1978, and I've been wanting one because I'm from the Southwest and everybody in my hometown has a set of antlers hanging up somewhere in their house. 
But I thought when I saw it online that this was like a piece of leather or something that was attached to it. And I thought, well, maybe I can take that off. And maybe I can like cover it with turquoise or do something crazy with it. But now I like it because when I went to purchase this at the estate sale, which was like the last day of the estate sale, and I think it was something ridiculous, like $15, they explained that this thing was a the bullet that killed the gritter. And I don't know if you're all, um, you know, NRA folks, but I didn't go out and shoot it. It was already dead for since 1978, so for 40 years. And I did not kill it, but I did not want to see it go into a landfill because that little critter gave its life, and I love it. Anyway, I will talk to you guys later. Have a great day. Go out and find your joy, and God bless. Bye.